And Charlie Francis said, the difference between average performers and high performers is that an average person, their highs are not high enough. They don't output enough power. But most importantly, their lows are not low enough, so they don't recover deep enough. Mm. The two biggest um, signs for successful Olympic sprinters is when they're standing behind their blocks before they're announced, those guys are yawning. They're relaxed. They're easy going. They know they put it in the work. And then with world champion jiu-jitsu guys, those guys are taking naps 10 minutes before because they know they've done everything. They're in an alpha state. They don't need to worry about you know stressing about X, Y, Z or their opponent. So you know, if you don't have enough inputs, then your output is going to... It's going to decrease, but your output also dictates the direction that you head. So you can't be this person, this yogi, softy person that's only doing cold therapy and only doing PEMF and only eating organic because you're just going to be, you know, this flimsy, skinny fat person that doesn't have, you know, the world will test your strength at some point. Like. Welcome to the Fredrickson Health Show, highlighting expert practitioners from health, fitness, injury prevention, functional medicine, and integrative medicine. If you are into upgrading and optimizing your health, this podcast is for you. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here is your host, Dr. Robert Fredrickson. Another episode of the Fredrickson Health Show. Today, we have a very, very special guest, Jared Leeper. Hello. Jared has been a wealth of knowledge in the fitness and wellness industry for a long time. He's got over 20,000 different hours in this industry, training D1 athletes, football players, national Olympic powerlifters, weightlifters, correct me if I'm wrong. And he just never stops learning. That's what I love about Jared is we have the most amazing conversations and it never stops. And so some of your influence has been, you know, Charles Polican. Mm-hmm. And I'll let you go. I'm, I'm, I don't want to steal your thunder. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, just like Newton said, right, we're just standing on the shoulders of giants. So I'm just trying to do my best to honor the guys that gave me the information and the inspiration and honor that in that, in that phase it is, our, is build your better. Um, yeah. No, I've been in the industry for 20 years and doing, been able to be blessed to travel the world as weightlifting coach, world champion, actually multi level multi-year world champion been in football baseball basketball so really any goal is is attainable through build your better so that's what we do around here so you were a captain on the football team oh yeah and then how did that transition into this health and wellness career were were you thinking you're going to do that when you were growing up did you think you were going to be you know what you are now as this you know leader in the fitness industry or how did this all come to fruition yeah i mean i've been called special my whole life but probably for different reasons than, <laughs> than what uh what you might think but not uh, playing sports growing up growing up in a small town and and you know thinking that you're a big fish in a small pond and then you get humbled the next level you know when you go to play sports in college level and you know i just always had this this will or this drive inside me to like prove somebody else wrong or prove myself right and you know whenever i came up against you know friction or came up against a steep hill or whatever you want to call it you know, just decided that hey like that was a good challenge and i want to make myself on that challenge and it's metastasized in a lot of different phases of business but also life as well that's awesome and you're no slot yourself in in uh, weightlifting tell us about some of your personal acc- accolades yeah, i'm an old man now but yeah my uh my biggest uh snatch is 126 so it's 270 276 pounds uh biggest clean jerk is um 146 kilos so just over 325 Right there, I actually did those numbers last year at oh, 39. Wow. So I'll be 40 in a month, which I mean, a bunch of people have done that. But you know, it's it's just a, a good passion, and constantly, I think, as many coaches, you know, we need to keep our blade sharp, right? So we can't get you know rest on our laurels from a physicality standpoint. We need to be representative of what we also practice and preach. We can't just be these theoretical minds that have all these concepts, but no application to the practice. And so I'd, that's a not only a personal drive and passion of of just Jared as himself, but also you, you know, you gotta, you gotta practice what you preach. Yeah. Walk the walk. Right. Mm -hmm. So tell us how you keep your personal blade sharp. What is kind of your routine for fitness, for wellness, and how does that translate to your clients? Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of like how I, you know, what my walk is and and how I cross that over to, to the clients, I, it's, it's simple, you know, just each and every day. I think that, you know, our motto here at BYB fitness is build your better and making sure that like, you know, each and every day you're going to have an opportunity and you have to, essentially focus on the decisions and the habits that you have and you have to run them through the filter of is this going to help push the needle to meet 
for me in a, in a positive direction or is it going to move the needle in the wrong direction? And I think it's easy, especially for a lot of coaches that you get, you know, what they call orthorexic or you get this, everything has to be perfect. And, and, you know, you also have to have that balance. And I think that's a word that probably gets abused a little bit. Like I just need balance in my life. Like, well, four day vendor is not quite balanced. Right. You know? Yeah. So I, you know, I want to be representative of that in my business, but also my own you know, personal health and fitness and, you know, we're in positions of leader. We're, you know, we're called to be leaders and we need to be, you know, take that with not just a grain of salt, but we need to, you know, to practice what we preach. Like I said, you're not going to go to a dentist that has a bunch of jacked up teeth and cavities and everything and believe anything that he's going to give you because you don't want to look like that. But in terms of, you know, answering your question is, you know, whatever the goal is with a client, whether that's, you know, just a, an average Joe that's got a bunch of weight to lose, like what can we do to give them the next piece so they can, they can move the needle forward, not trying to overwhelm them, but, you know, give them the right thing so they can have that, that next day be that much closer to what they're trying to accomplish. So I've been training with Jared for about three years, uh, since one of the start when you came down to yeah. Texas from Portland and, um, your training philosophy is a little bit different than a lot of the different experiences I've kind of been through. And I, I think I told you this uh, recently is, you know, I've been to so, so many different CrossFit gyms yeah. um, in particular, and I've always been hurt. You know, mm -hmm. thankfully I've been a chiropractor. I, was, I could, you know, manage those injuries, rehab those inter injuries. But with you, I've been here three years and I haven't really had a significant injury where I've had to take time off or had to rehab or had to really stretch and warm up, you know, more than I normally do. So, what is kind of your philosophy to building a, uh, a successful training program? That's a great question. I mean, I've been trying to break you. I've been trying really, really hard. Maybe it's just I don't, I don't try hard enough to break you. <laughs> yeah, so in, you know, from a training standpoint, you think of it as Louis Simmons said this. So he said, a pyramid can grow, only grow as tall as the base is wide from a mathematical standpoint. So you don't see very many really tall structures that have little tiny foundations. So when we start with folks, you know, we have all kinds of different people with all kinds of different walks of life, injury histories. You know, you've got some ankles that have seen some days and said some yeah. things and done some stuff and gone through some surgeries. And, you know, we just have to take that into account. But, you know, we, we want to start very, very broad in, in our training methodologies. A lot of people call this GPP, general physical preparedness. Um, again, that's uh, a Louis Simmons West Side barbell methodology. But, you know, you have to, in that baseline, that base of the pyramid, there's a lot of volume, right? So you have a lot of reps. There's very light intensity. It's not very heavy, but, you know, we want to make sure that you have, you know, like we use a lot of strong man or farm fit movements in that beginning phase. So there's a lot of concentric movements. So you're getting a lot of reps, a lot of volume, but a lot of the soreness, what you'll have is whether it's from, you know, eccentrics is one part, a ton of volume, plyometrics, and then a lot of weight, right? So those are kind of the, the four main factors that will influence the stimulus of, of soreness. But if people don't have that foundation underneath them, then that's where you have to start them. You know, personal training, same same type of thing. Eventually, once you've established that broad base, you've got some oxygen, you've got some you know catheterization of the muscle, and you've got some good structure underneath there. That's when you can go into the next level of intensity, what they call like spe specific physical preparedness (SPP), right? And then in the difference in athletics as opposed to general population training is that you know, most people will stay in the SPP and GPP phase and you can just wave it and undulate it as you go in your programming. And then athletes, it's a little bit different ball game, especially with like Olymp Olympic weightlifting. So, you know, Kit, for example, we knew that, Hey, second week of August for her to get on the international platform and, and be able to get on the podium, she had to be able to hit 62 kilo snatch and an 89 kilo clean and jerk. Well, in our training, say we start in January, we can reverse engineer that day, right? So we know exactly, hey, that day, those are going to be the numbers. So you go back, you know, three, six weeks, 12 weeks, you go back another 24 weeks. In Olympic cycles, they call them quads. So there's four, four year training blocks that they do. The power sports are a bit different in how you design your programming, you know, Olympic weightlifting and sprinting and those types of things, as opposed to the artistic sports, you know, nothing against uh, you know, the artistic gymnastics, it's still very, very difficult, but it's just a, a little bit different ball game. So in general population, again, we just undulate through that SPP and GPP phase. And then sometimes we get a little bit heavier. Sometimes we had a little bit more volume. We go from intensification to accumulation, intensification, accumulation. And then every once in a while we'll have a peak, usually in GPP stuff or general population stuff in our gym. What we'll have is we'll have one, maybe two times a year where we're actually te testing maximal strength. Right. It's not a necessity for everybody, but you know, we really want to also quantify what we do in terms of, in terms of the training. Right. So we need to track that as well. So this is an interesting question, maybe a fun question for you. 
How has your training thought process changed or evolved from when you first started? I mean, when you first started, were you, you know, just going all out on certain movements yeah. and how was your recovery back then versus what you've evolved to for now, maybe personally, but also for your clients? Yeah. That's and, what, and if you could go back in time, what would you do differently? Yeah, I, I probably wouldn't change anything in the past. It's not like I'm one of those folks that has no regrets. There's some things in my life like, man, I probably wouldn't open that door or gone down that road, you know, given the chance. But you know, I think that your your story as a person and as a coach, you know, it's there for a reason. You you make those stumbles and you make those pitfalls for an absolute reason. You know, they, there's a saying that says, you know, good judgment comes from experience, but experience comes from bad judgment. So if you don't fail and you don't have things where you're like, messing up i'll use a good story so that first year that we went to world championships with kit we're in barcelona we trained almost a year for this so we, we built everything like i just said like he built it perfectly so she can hit this number on the platform well i made a mistake as a young coach of warming her up to her opening weight mm. so she gets on the platform and she's supposed to snatch 62 kilos and she misses well she's got to follow herself so she has two minutes the pressure's up first time at world championships for both of us nerves are gone you get a little nervous and then you miss again it's like okay well, we got to try to buy a little bit of time, give her an extra weight bump at 63 kilos. She misses again. In world championships, you don't get another shot to go hit your clean and jerk. So you've got, that's your day. So you you had six minutes of lifting for 10 months of preparation and a whole bunch of money on the way out. The cool part about that is once we got off of that last miss and the snatch, you said, okay, well, we, we, we prepped you out. Let's hit our clean and jerks on the practice platform. We paid to be here, so let's do this. And, that was a heavy emotional, but also a very heavy session in and of itself. But the conversation was, I'm not going to allow anything in this next year of training to get in my way from being up there and being victorious on the platform. 2019, she goes to Montreal. She's fourth in, in the world uh, in her total. 2020, world champion. 2021, world champion. 22, world champion. So if it wasn't for those failures and it wasn't for those mistakes that her and I both made together, then, you know, she wouldn't have had that success. And, and I think it's just a great microcosm of just coaching in general. So you want, you got to make those mistakes and you got to make those errors. You know, if you see a carpenter that's got perfectly clean hands and, and, you know, doesn't have any calluses, like haven't, they haven't done the work. They haven't hit their thumb enough times to know where, you know, where the good ground is to, right, to, to right. mine there. <clears throat> that's awesome. Yeah. I love that story. And I'm sure you were pretty uh, upset at yourself. Yeah, I, I would be, right? Yeah. So, Oh, I remember the smell of the room. I remember the temperature. Yeah. I remember looking back at her husband, who's a big guy. Love you, Mike. Uh, and just the feeling there. But you can't create that you know, artificially in your mind. You kind of have to experience it. Luckily, you know, we had a, a plan and a trust to be able to come back and, and be victorious that next year. But you, know, you can't take away those things in the moments. It sucks. You don't want to be there. But that's in retrospect. But you have to have that stuff big and small in life. Yeah, that's awesome. So I want to talk a little bit about some of your just recent success stories with your clients. You know, go ahead, um, brag on them a little bit. Tell us about some of uh, maybe your biggest weight loss patients, yep. maybe personal milestones that some of your clients have had. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, to, to answer that question and the previous question, what I would have done earlier, I probably would have had more of an integrative relationship when I went off and, and branched out on my own with people like you, um, you know, and, and be able to not be the center hub of everything. You know, again, as a coach, we have limitations, you know, not only, you know, from a degree standpoint, but also from our abilities, but also I think a lot of coaches tend to want to try to get more office hours and more work, more you know, blood work type of stuff. When our main thing is like, Hey, we're, we're supposed to be like sharpening the blade in the gym and, and helping out influencing nutritional stuff. So I, in retrospect, I, I would have had, you know, been able, and I didn't know at the time, but been able to find more, you know, folks like yourself so I could bounce information and get blood work on the back end. So we have a guy right now that we've actually both worked with. His name's Rick, fantastic guy. And he's got a heck of a story in terms of trials and overcoming adversity and, and believing a false narrative in his life. So he had a, and uh, I'm sure he's very proud to be able to have us share this. Uh, but Rick had a medical discharge in, uh, in the army. He was doing too many movements of a certain, uh, too many reps of a certain movement and he had a spondylolisthesis in his L5. So he had a spinal shift right there. And then, you know, essentially it was very, very painful to do anything. Couldn't bend over, couldn't walk, you know, he couldn't, you know, and, and when he goes to the VA, you know, he gets that medical discharge. So he's no longer in, uh, in the military, but he goes to the VA and they give him pain medication and just kind of, you know, tell him this tale that, Hey, this is what it's going to be like for you. So kind of just get ready to ride this train as far as, as far as you can get ready for pain medication, you know, try to, 
you know, every, every, you know, coaches or, you know, some doctors are like, follow a good diet. Like, great. That's like, tell me you don't know where North is, but try to find North. Right. You know? Right. But, you know, Rick had over a series of years had gained, you know, a hundred pounds of weight that he didn't need anymore. And he was just waiting for somebody to come in and, and speak into his life and guide him. And so well, I was fortunate enough, fortunate enough to be that guy and, um, in November of 2022 now. So he's been working with us for about 15 months. But one of the first things I did was put him with you and start to get a lot of his blood work right. And we knew there was a lot of gaps that needed to be filled, but that foundation and have him understanding like, hey, you know, if you want to change your life, you have all the resources right at your hand, but you know, we can only do so much to guide you and tell you where there's good gold to be mined, where there's good ground to be dug up. So you have to do the work and, you know, Again, big shout out to him. He's lost over 92 pounds. He just, uh, he trapped deadlifted 383 the other wow. day. Like, mm, very and, impressive. And without any kind of, contra like no problems with his back, whatever. I mean, he's just walking around now. You know, he had this, and that's one of my favorite things is you don't know what people have inside of them until you put, you know, the nose to the grindstone and put some work in. You don't know what people are made of until you put some adversity in front of them. You can't just artificially create that stuff between your ears. Yeah, there is, visu you know, visualizing things. But at the end of the day, like, yeah, little time will tell for sure um, to seal that. When Michelangelo finished the Statue of David, you know, he gets this, this raw block of marble that's 15 feet tall and three tons, this huge thing. And it took him, you know, at the time he was like 23 years old and it took him three years to, to make David. And so he gets done with David and it's still, you know, it's the, the pinnacle of, of statues and marble work. And this reporter comes up to him and is like, hey, how, uh, good job. How did you create David? And he just, Michelangelo kind of scoffs at him and said, I didn't create David. I just used the right tool at the right time at the right technique with the right amount of force and allowed the, the marble to remove the excess and reveal David from within. So we have that in all of our systems. Our bodies are, are wired for that, for success. But the world that we're in, you know, in today in our environment will change that. That's why I have a bust of David in, in my office is for that exact story. Yeah. Yeah, now Rick is an amazing testament just mm -hmm. to uh, its dedication, willpower, and the right yeah. team can do. I mean, it takes, he, mm -hmm. you said it took years for him to gain that weight, mm -hmm. and then he lost it in less time than it took to gain, which mm -hmm. is pretty impressive. So usually it doesn't happen that way. And from the weight loss, 92, 93 pounds, he doesn't mind us uh, saying this, by the way. He gives permission. Yeah, we should give him more. Yeah. More shout out. Yeah, mm -hmm. but um, and his, his lab levels, I mean, they were just um, drastic changes. And, and hormone levels, testosterone had a rapid increase naturally, by the way. Right. And um, it was just a testament to the team approach. And I think what you said earlier with, you know, we all, we all have, we can, you know, I can do fitness, but it's not my forte, right? So, I mean, of course I can guide a patient, hey, here's what you need to do, but you, this is what, this is your world. This is the world you live in. And you know labs, you can look at some labs here and there, but, you know, I think just having that integrative team approach really helps helps everyone. Right. Right. Because the doctor says, Hey, like we're going to look at your labs. You need to eat right, exercise, do these things. But then it's like, what does that mean? Right. And so Rick's been in with you day in, day out, mm -hmm. you know, doing the work, do, doing the plan and it's paid off. I mean, he's a different person. I mean, yeah. you just, Oh yeah. Physically, physiologically. I mean, I mean everything you know, mentally. I mean, it's just a, it's just a huge, it's a 180. And so it's just amazing to see. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't understand that obesity is depression turned inwards. And so when somebody has, you know, that amount of weight and the lab values to, I mean, you can look at this lady's lab values from prior to where he is now. You're like, that's two different people. There's absolutely no way. But when you have that level of, of, of depression and insecurity and just stress, it's just a daily, like, you know, pressure cooker of compression is, you know, to to trust somebody and go through the process and actually let that off. Like, you know, one of my favorite things about him, you know, he's talking because he's, you know, it's a single guy now and he's like, tell me about your dates this week. So he's getting some good reps. He's out there looking for a good woman to, to live a life with. And like, that's what it's really about. Like it's yeah. cool to lift the, lift the things and get your mag levels up. I'm a huge fan of that, but like somebody's going to actually like live and thrive and like in accomplish things and do things and have conversations that they never thought I would like, People don't really think about that when you go take a, take a personal training certification. Right. But like that's yeah. the good stuff for sure. Yeah. That's what makes it worth it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you did a recent seminar and yeah. um, we're not going to do the whole seminar over again, but tell us about kind of the, the three pillars mm. 
or the three foundational tenants. And then let's kind of walk through some of those cool. so people can get a better understanding and they can help build yeah. their better. Yeah, I had notes in the seminar, so this is gonna be off the top of the head. But uh, yeah, we I expected to have this a 45 minute talk and I looked down at my watch at the end and it was two hours and, and it, it, was, it was outstanding. So and we, we think about you know life in general from a physicality standpoint standpoint is we have essentially three concentric circles right so on the top you have your byb strength and conditioning or you know for folks that, that aren't here in texas with us is training right so that is our output right so whenever you're you're lifting or you know you show up to a gym you do a workout or you're in a training program you're in a training block like that is what we call yang that's fire that's output right so that's that's all a reflection of what our potential what we call our yin is so the bottom two pillars so we have training up top bottom left uh is what's called your recovery right so think of that as like your lifestyle in terms of like sleep sleep hygiene what you're doing for exogenous uh, recovery sources we have an infrared sauna uh, clear light sanctuary why infrared sauna here there's like the cadillac ferrari of infrared sauna it's awesome oh so, uh, yeah it's, <laughs> it was it was quite an investment but it was well worth it for yeah. sure so what we call our, our big four in terms of our non-invasive recovery therapies here so you have infrared sauna we have there's there's your heat we have a red light therapy there's your light therapy so it's a very specific also manufactured by clear light um, red light therapy unit that, that goes in the sauna so it's the only one in the world that you can actually simultaneously do red light and also be in the sauna because most of the red light therapies available on the market don't have enough cooling power and don't have enough engineering on the back end mm. it took them three years to manufacture it which is pretty cool so you can simultaneously knock out two of our big four non-invasive therapies so you have heat you have light we also have cold plunge here so now you have the two spectrums of recovery in terms of your heat exposure whether that's you're talking about heat shock proteins or you're just trying to get some lymphatic drainage or you just want to move and feel a little bit better and then you have the other spectrum is your cold shock protein so we keep our cold plunge it's a uh, it's a unit local into Texas here, um, Revive Cold Plunge. Ben and his team are, are awesome. They've been very supportive and, and make a really, really good product. Um, so we recommend, you know, in our, our saunas and light therapy, 20 minutes sauna is 20 to 45 minutes. And then cold plunge, I just tell people the first time, do 61 seconds all the way up to your neck. If you make it to 61 seconds, that's it's easy from there out. So people go all the way up to 15 minutes. And then the last one that we added in our recovery bucket, is our pulse electromagnetic field therapy. And I'll, I'll tell the people listening right now, if you don't know about PEMF, you're about to find out real quick because it's gonna be a big wave uh, in, in the States. It's been FDA approved for many years and Eastern Europeans and Russians have been using it for very many years, which is part of the reason why they're so successful. They've been using magnetic therapy. Um, so we apply that. So we have our four big recovery items. And then that bottom right concentric circle is our nutrition right so that includes your supplementation that includes how you eat what you eat when you eat how much of it includes you know any pharmaceutical that you might be taking the hydration what you eat what you drink when you drink how much you drink and so those those are kind of the big three concentric circles and you know if you have just two of 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 the circles in your life you're not going to have optimal output right because your 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 inputs and your outputs are directly correlated correlated to one another so when they people talk about like your you know your energy output the fire is the output of like an oil lamp and the oil within is all the potential so the yin is the oil in the lamp and then the fire is the yang right and so if you don't replenish your oil in your lamp you're not going to have very big output there's a really good strength coach um rest in peace his name is charlie francis who was uh, ben johnson olympic sprinter from canada who's his coach and charlie francis said the difference between Average performers and high performers is that an average person, their highs are not high enough. They don't output enough power, but most importantly, their lows are not low enough. So they don't recover deep enough. Mm. The two biggest um, signs for successful Olympic sprinters is when they're standing behind their blocks before they're announced, those guys are yawning. They're relaxed. They're easy going. They know they put it in the work. And then with world champion jiu-jitsu guys, those guys are taking naps 10 minutes before because they know they've done everything. They're in an alpha state. They don't need to worry about you know, stress about X, Y, Z or their opponent. So, you know, if you don't have enough inputs, then your output is going to, is going to decrease, but your output also dictates the direction that you head. So you can't be this person, this yogi softy person that's only doing cold therapy and only doing PEMF and only eating organic because you're just going to be, you know, this flimsy skinny fat person that doesn't have, you know, the world will test your strength at some point. Like it's coming, you know, it's coming for us, whether we get in a car wreck or we have to, you know, carry somebody, you know, I had to, 
carry a dog a mile <laughs> down the down a big hill in the northwest. And I was like, man, I'm really glad I'm training. And I also smell like wet dog. But <laughs> no, it's good. So that, that that's kind of the, the bigger, broader of our concentric circles in BYB. And we can kind of jump a little bit deeper into some of the, the metrics or some of the things that we look for, if you like. Yeah, I'd love to. So, yeah, yeah so I mean, so say, say maybe you're – you're an athlete and I, I used to train like an athlete and I still kind of do, but now, you know, I'm getting older and I shouldn't be healthy. I want to be able to pick up my kids, my grandkids when I'm 80. I want to be able to get off the floor really easily. Um, you know, I want to be able to run from a threat if I need to, or yeah. still be my kids at baseball practice, yeah. you know? So what are some ways that you can train an older population to stay healthy? And also, I want, so I want to go through the three cool. columns but I want to go through kind of um, the cheapest, yeah, most affordable option. Then I want to go to the Ferrari or the Lamborghini yeah. of those. And then maybe find a happy medium. So people can kind of say, hey, if, if we don't have access to a pimp, right. a red light, sauna, cold plunge, what can they do at home? Cool. If they don't have access to the best supplements, what can they take for now until yeah. they can afford these things? So we're, we're, yeah, let's get like a baseline of where they can start for training first. Mm -hmm. And then to kind of work our way through those. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think in terms of like your training stuff, first is move, get 10,000 steps a day. Like just, just get moving. I mean, the body has to heal through its blood. And if you're in a sedentary state, you're going to be, you're only training yourself to be in that sedentary state. And I think that, you know, your body is, your tissues are like dogs and they're either well-trained or they're untrained. So I don't sit much in this 90, 90 position. And I'm glad that I don't because I can feel right now it's, it's, it's not going to be working for me long term, but we get, you know, we get used to our positions, the way our spines, you know, adapt and the way that our, eventually our vertebrates can turn trapezoidal and you get this, you know, this hunched position and you've seen it in, in older populations that have been living like that, you know, it's posture adjustment, right? But they've been living <laughs> like that for a long time. And then as soon as, I mean, as soon as your verts turn and you have no more curvature in your spine, you don't have all five of your curves, then like you're, you're cashed out. Like you can't just get a spinal replacement and just get a new, I mean, hip, knee, whatever, but you're, that whole thing sets up. So tangent, I'm, I'm really good at tangents, by the way. So from a free standpoint, training 10,000 steps a day, you know, get out and move, breathe. It's also our bodies and our minds are in the same vehicle. So if you're struggling or if you're frustrated or if you have an issue that you're trying to work on that, you know, you're noodling on, like get out and get into a flow state. There's a really good book by a, um, a Turkish guy, uh, his, his name, his last name is like 16 letters long. So, but the book title is called Flow and it teaches you how to get into different flow states. So getting out and walking is one of the best ways to get into flow states. And we also, you know, like Mark Twain said, you know, out of the thousands of tragedies that have happened in my life, only a few have come true. So being able to get and get some movement. In terms of free stuff, yep, great, 10,000 steps a day. I would also recommend totally free, unless you live in <laughs> Central and, and, and East Texas, is find a mountain and do some hill sprints, right? From a hormonal profile standpoint, that's one of the best ways to increase your androgenic uh, profile. So you'd be able to boost up DHT, DH, or excuse me, testosterone. You know, be able to have those you know things that you need to live in this world today and fight from a hormonal standpoint. That's a really good way. So to you're talking that. sprint up, walk down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of a lot of populations in the beginning for somebody that's like sedentary, I would just say walk briskly up and then peruse just casually. Walk Rest down. in between or yeah. keep going depending on. The intensity? Yeah. So it, you're depending upon your initial ability. I mean, 30 seconds on is great. Two and a half to three minutes okay. off is fine. So you don't want to, you know, you want to try to have, you know, deep rest, but also higher output as you get stronger. And as you improve, that's when you can start to push the needles in, in different ways. Um, another good one is walking uphill backwards, right? So mm. in terms of long-term knee health, Charles was talking about that stuff yeah. you know, in, in the eighties, a lot of backward sled pulls and all now that. there's a knees over toe guy who's yeah. made, made that all really popular. Yeah, and he was taking all of Charles' stuff. He does, and, yeah, he does yeah. take Charles' stuff. I mean, yeah. you know, shout out to him, and he does, you know, he's also expanded a little bit, and I think he delivers the message in uh, a little bit more digestible way than, you know, Charles is a very polarizing person, but, you know, his, his, his methodology and his information was fantastic. So uh, 10,000 steps a day, I would do hill sprints and, or hill brisk walking, um, walk up hills backwards. And a lot of movement practices, you know, your body speaks through movement and you know, it does go, shift a little bit more into the recovery side of it. But from physicality, physicality standpoint, stretch, just move, right? You know, it's stiff. It's, it's not a big mystery, right? Yeah. We all know that we got tight hip flexors. We got internal sh shoulder rotation. Our head posture is terrible. So just get into that reverse, reverse position of that. Mm -hmm. We call that the crab position or, you know, gymnastics, they call that tabletop. So mm -hmm. get in that extended position. Um, 
you know, and then in terms of like fat loss stuff for output, you know, a couple of things walking helps out quite a bit, but actually one of my favorites is swimming. Right? Swimming, okay. Yeah, and if you can get into a cold pool and you can tolerate that, that'll, that'll move the needle quite a bit for you. I wouldn't say any longer than 45 minutes, but the nice part about swimming, especially, and that's Rick did that prior to training with us, is because the only thing that he could tolerate, you're getting concentric resistant and resistance in all different planes of motion. There's not a whole lot of hip extension with it. You know, think of like jumping and pulling, but you're having so much blood flow in the water and there's no eccentrics, right? So you get no pressure on the yeah, joints either. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so, so it, you're able to increase your, you know, increase your, your, uh, your time in, in the water. Find, try to find a, a pool that's saline or salt. If you're doing chlorine, make sure that you get some vitamin C in your water. Chlorine, we trained a guy that was the most highly decorated uh, swimmer in Oregon history and he had a full ride to Louisville. Uh, but one of the things about Michael is that his teeth were starting to like wear down a little bit. So if you can get vitamin C and swish that in your water, that'll help protect your teeth. But other than that, yeah, those are- Orally, there. right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, got it. Yes, yeah. I mean, if you can get IV vitamin C, like that was, that's also, I mean, that'll do some- What about a liposomal? Have you ever tried those? I haven't, no. Yeah. No, yeah, just, we do just buffered vitamin C and just yeah. do it in powder um, in the water, but swish it in your teeth too. So that's, that'd be a good one for outputs. Where do you want to go next? Okay, so we got the, we got the fitness. Cool. So we're we're, we're start, starting at ground level. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about nutrition. Where do they start? Cool. Yeah. So the big tenants actually before we even start talking about what you eat is first thing is chew your food, right? Your teeth are in your mouth. They're not in your esophagus. They're not in your stomach. They're not in your small intestine, large intestine. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness they're not on the back end too. Right? <laughs> right. So when you have to you choose your food, there's your selection, right? And then there's preparation, how you cook it. And then there's mastication, how you eat it. And there's digestion, absorption, and assimilation. Those all have to happen in sequential order. You know, mm -hmm. once you, f digestion is a process that starts on the plate and ends in the toilet. And if you skip steps, you're really, really, you know, messing yourself up. So we tell people 32 chew. I was talking to a client the other day. Per bite. Like, per bite. Per bite. Yep. Chew your food 32 times. Per bite of small. yogurt or are we talking steak or... Yeah, yeah. So if it's if it's mashed up like mashed sweet potatoes or something that's a little bit mushier, like <laughs> it'd be funny. To see. I mean, people do that though. Like you say, thirty two chew, and then they're out there chewing water. <laughs> but it, but it increases satiety, and it, you know, right. there's definitely there's mechanisms for GLP one, good ghrelin, leptin signaling with more chewing, and it's easier said than done. I know that I'm very busy, and so I don't yeah. sometimes do that, but I should. Yeah. How much time should we be, you know, sitting down per meal? To I mean. If you're doing 32 chews with a good size protein source, how many chews is that? Yeah, I think that's a, you're, you're trying to preach to me because this is also where I struggle. You know, I, we say that like no screen, no screens in front of you and then 32 chew, but I, you know, we tend to get stressed and rushed in our lives. So, you know, they say that, you know, the, for their, for leptin to hit your stomach, it's, you know, hit your brain. It's like 20 minutes, right? 20 but minutes. Yeah. I can step on the Lego and know immediately that my foot's hurting. Um, so I yeah, just take your time, you know, your meal times should also be your peace time. So there's two free things. Number one, chew your food Two, take your time. No screens, like enjoy your meal. Like don't eating. be looking at emails while you're eating. Right. Right. Yeah. If you're multitasking. You're doing something poorly. Right. right? Yeah. I think that's a, a great point. Um, on the second part of that. So you got 32 chew. In terms of food selection, you know, we try to run things through the caveman filter, right? So if a caveman could eat it, it's probably a good food to eat. Another good tenant of nutrition, right? So tap on the caveman stuff, right? Could a caveman get a hold of a steak? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, keep them coming. Like, double down. Yeah. Would you like more bread, sir? No, just more steaks. Keep them coming. Could a caveman get a donut? Probably not, right? So you want to try to eliminate some of those processes and some of the downstream foods. Another good filter to run your nutrition through is eat real foods not too much and a lot of vegetables, a lot of vegetables, which will keep you full. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your, your, in, your small intestine and your, and your, just your biome, your gut biome is a rainforest, right? And so it has to have a lot of variety of things. There are people out there. I'm not trying to bash on, you know, carnivore or, or veganism, but there are people out there that have food sensitivities and these weird autoimmune disorders that if you cut out a lot of things like, yeah, that's going to bring down, they get better. Yeah. Right. But long term, I think the jury is still, quite a bit out you know people ask me what my position on veganism is or carnivores like the mere necessity of each like those are the on the polar opposites of that so yeah we say we make the ask the caveman question before you eat 32 chew eat real food not too much a fair amount of vegetables make those choices from there 
Yeah, and it, can, it can be simple. It's just, hey, eat real food. Don't eat processed food. Mm -hmm. You know, the outside of the perimeter of the grocery store is mm -hmm. kind of the fresher food. Right. It's not highly processed or ultra processed. Right. Chew it. Right. Digest it. Get into that parasympathetic state mm -hmm. and conquer. Right. Yeah. So, There's kind of a hierarchy when it, especially when it comes like, you know, food and vegetables, stuff that grows out of the ground. Right. So you can get the, the veggies from the restaurant. Then you can go to the market and get stuff straight out of HEB and then you can get organic and then you can go to the farmer's market and all this is local stuff but the the pinnacle of it is stuff that you grow at your house right because that mm. was made with love yeah that was there was time and effort and thought put into that there was you know a bit of an emotional connection to the food like I hope these radishes grow I hope I hope I hope they did a study where they want to know the energy on food right and our own plants and so they they had two different ferns and they were both given the same amount of water from the same source and they're in the same amount of light for the same amount of time. But one fern was yelled at and told it was stupid uh, every day. And the other fern was talked to. That it, was, it was beautiful. It was wonderful. It was going to be nourishing. And the, the fern that was given negativity grew in a weird way. So, again, that, that top level is that homegrown organic with that soil and that water. And you gave love onto it. So those are, you know, again, more Ferrari level stuff. But, like, if you can start planting and growing your own food, like, you're going to be winning some major battles in your life. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, we raised a cow. Um I think 2020, and mm -hmm. it was kind of a very cool process. The kids would go out there, we'd feed the cow, yeah. and um, th then we, you know, it fed the family. Mm -hmm. And so we all kind of split it between family members, and yeah. which is a really cool experience, yeah. you know. So Yeah, we, we slaughtered a cow you know, last uh, last fall, I, wanted, I think it was October, and, and same, same type of thing. Like, you know, it's, it's just a different experience. But also, it's, there's a cost benefit to that, and you're not supporting, you know, large you know, factory farms and, and all that stuff. And our freezer went out, so we lost a lot of meat. Oh, on man. Port. It was terrible. Oh, it was like a, the worst possible thing ever. Like a breaker switch turned off. And uh, uh, anyways, I'll give you all right. So I'll, I'll make you feel a little better. I got a buddy that uh, he decided to say, forget the the city living. I'm going to go out and live in the country. And he's got a bunch of goats, and they had a cow, and they were getting ready to slaughter this cow. He's originally a city boy, so this is kind of the first time experience. And I, I just t hats off to him because this is not an easy thing to do. I was I grew up in the country and raised sheep and all that stuff, so it takes time to learn. So this this cow of his was stubborn and it couldn't it wouldn't go back into their property in their yard. He's like, you know what? It's harvest times come early, and so he went to shoot it and he missed. Oh no! And he shot from a little bit of distance. He was you know when when he had a an animal like that you're supposed to shoot behind the ear or in the eye so that it just immediately kills it and you waste no meat well he ended up gut shooting it mm. it was also his his birthday weekend so i ended up seeing him on that day i was like i asked him like how's the cow going he's like oh i had this issue i shot it this morning so he gut shot it and then walked up and shot it two more times in the heart and then had something busy schedule wise and so he had to leave and it was like 65 degrees and so he's telling me this about three hours after this dead cow it's got all his guts in it Filed up on his property, and he pretty much lost all of it. So don't don't worry. Like there's there's always yeah. It, it just tells me there's always somebody out there that's that's doing things differently and in, in, in a different way than than us. So you're good. So that scared anybody? Just eat real food. Just eat real food. Yeah, yeah it's eat real food. Yeah, yeah. we don't. Have to. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna make a lot of vegans. Don't worry. Like, yeah, sorry you don't about be like Hitler and Mussolini and, and Napoleon. Yeah. Like don't be a vegan. Well, let's talk about protein. You had a really good um, some really good thoughts around mm -hmm. protein intake, timing. And an amount. Can you kind of walk through yeah. how much protein the average and athletic individual should be taking right. daily and how we should incorporate that into our daily lives? Right, right. I think that's probably one of the most commonly violated things is, is people don't understand the types of protein that they need to intake, the amount of protein they need to intake, preparation, all these different things. So we tell our folks that train with us regularly three to six days a week that they need to be about 1.0 grams of protein per uh, goal of body weight. So if somebody's you know, a gal's 150 pounds and she wants to be 165 pounds, she has to have 1.0 grams of animal protein per pound of body weight. This would include a post-workout shake. Per pound of actual body weight or to like desired, target body? Yeah, desired, yeah, got it. Target, so if you weigh, better word. So if you weigh 200, but your target weight is 180, mm -hmm. 180 grams. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then people that are training multiples or people that are in athletics and, you know, have long sessions a day, they need to be more in 1.1 to 1.2 grams of protein per pound of body weight. Depends. Some sports are, are weight class based, like Olympic weightlifting is weight class based. So you still got to have a lot of intake of protein, but you can't get outside of your weight class. Whereas other sports like football, 
you know, it, it's just intake as much as possibly can in, in that sense. Um, but it has to be animal protein. So if you're, you know, eating cereal that has protein in it, like we, we want to make sure that doesn't count. That's, that's a net zero right there. Right. And people don't realize like that's a fair amount of protein to intake. That said, there well, are- Especially if you're looking at macros and you say, oh, this has 10 grams of protein. Yeah. Log it in 10 grams and you look at your total chart, you right. think you can hit your, your numbers. Right. But it wasn't from animal sources. So it might not be that complete amino acid profile. Of course, yeah. The word protein in, its, in itself in Greek means of utmost importance. So that's always the first thing that you should intake in a meal. That'll offset the glycemic index and the glycemic response that your that your body has to 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 food. You know, so if you if you're eating rice cakes first in your meal as opposed to eating you know ribeye steak, your body's gonna have a completely different reaction to that, and then you'll end up paying the price, you know, uh, based on your selection. So I always want people to eat protein first in the in in the meal. You want to have 1.0 depending on you know general population, 0.9 to 1.0 grams of protein per pound of desired body weight, 32 chew, right? And then, um, so that's, that's always kind of like the main thing, how you set up your, your macro um, intake, right? So for someone who's maybe new to this, what, is, what does that look like? How, how, does, how do you do it? Like, tell us about kind of like what 180 grams of protein could look like yeah. sa as a sample. Yeah, that's a good question. So it depends on the amount of steak there's, um, it's easy, you can just Google it. So some foods are a little bit more dense in grams of protein per, per actual ounce itself. I think the pork chops and um, and lamb chops are actually some of the more dense. Um, and then some of the, the white the white meats, you know, things like chicken, turkey's actually up there. Uh, they have different amounts of protein per gram. So, you know, it is an inconvenience to, to weigh and measure your food, but you don't know what you don't know, right? And so once you can kind of get your head wrapped around how much protein is, you know, 180 or 200 grams, I mean, I'm, I average between you know 220 and 250 depending upon the training block that I'm in. So I mean, I'm eating. Do you, you know, just take a day? Yeah. So I depending on what it is, I have a lot of variety, right? So right now, yesterday I had elk. Um, I had two pounds of elk, and then I'll I'll alternate two pounds that. of elk. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, 32 ounces. Uh huh. Delicious. And All at the same time? Uh, no, throughout the day. Okay. The day. I mean, I've I've eaten a lot of. I think we went to one of our Texas local. Uh, uh, barbecue joints and I've eaten, I think I had a three pound rib <laughs> once. Three pound rib? I wouldn't recommend it, but it was delicious. But how much did the bone weigh? Right, so maybe. Hey, I ate the bone too. You ate the bone? No, I'm just what? Bone <laughs> I'm marrow, just right? Or something? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Hey, I just got to get some extra magnesium that's locked in there. <laughs> right, I will find a way. Um, but yeah, so I'll have a couple pounds uh, in a day. Um, and, and I feel like if I, if, if something comes up schedule wise and I don't have that, like my training starts taking effect mm. and like, I don't feel strong and the weight's like, how much, you know, these kilos weigh how much now, you know? So it's, it definitely makes a difference. So we set up our whole macro, you know, based upon what that protein goal is. And then you can adjust the carbs and, and the fat based upon your body composition, how lean you are, how much, you know, again, how much muscle you have, you know, cause we want to, you know, everything that you make has to run through that filter of trying to move mm. the needle. So if you had a client who's trying to lose weight, how do you incorporate protein in there? Mm -hmm. What kind of deficit, if you even call it that, would you put them on? Yeah. And what are some just lifestyle things that you might yeah. also put them on? Yeah. So you got to think based on your size, your exercise output is 200 to 300 calories per, but in strength training, it's a little bit different. There's what's called the exercise post oxygen consumption epoch. So if you're just doing 200 calories and it's an accurate, uh, accurate measurement on your elliptical, then pretty much post-workout that, that epoch stops. So there you got 200, but in a strength training session, say you burn 150 calories in that session, that epoch will keep going after the session. So you might burn you know, another 150 just having to recover from that workout. So not all workouts, not all calories out and in are created equally. If somebody is a little bit more body fat, right? So they say about 15% body fat, you can start to see that linea alba, that line in between your abs, right? So that's a good marker for leanness. If you're trying to continue to get leaner, you know, at 15%, there's a couple different factors that you think about, right? Where you need a little bit more carbohydrate to get leaner. But somebody, you know, like Rick, when he started, you know, he was 34 and a half, 35% body fat. So, you know, his... his what is he now? Uh, he just, he's like right at 20. 20%, wow. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what, probably... So, so you go off the linear alba. I always went off like a bicep vein or something like that. Yeah, you can start to see some of the anatomy. Um, and those are just basic rules of thumbs. We use a, a, a program here called Biosignature in, co in, uh, in combination with a DEXA scan. It's probably your, your best option 
in terms of establishing your body fat number? It's a great question because not many people know exactly what their body fat percentage is. So biosignature, again, created by Charles Poliquin in, uh, in accordance with a guy named Dr. Mark Hewson, who runs a hyper, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's a big name in the, in the industry. Uh, he runs a hypertension institute in Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah. So his athletes, Charles' athletes, you know, would, would show up with different, you know, issues. Some of his hockey players had, you know, large amounts of belly fat, and then they started doing blood panels, and Houston started looking at, like, okay, his cortisol is a bit out, so he adjusts mm. his inflammation, and soon enough, the belly fat started going down. So that gives you, not only it's important because it tells you with a good, somebody that's very proficient at pinching, within 0.5%, plus or minus, tell you pretty much right where your body fat is. The, the drawback with biosignature is it doesn't measure, measure visceral fat, so that's our fat that's mm -hmm. underneath um, our abdominal wall. DEXA scan will do that, but the drawback with DEXA scan is it doesn't tell you the millimeters down to the tenth of a millimeter mm. where your body stores its fat, whereas biosignature gives you your 12 sites measurement. So with Rick, we were able to, to do the biosignature and then make his carb adjustments and fat adjustments accordingly. And you know, he's in the beginning, he, you know, he wasn't really allowed to have much of a relationship with carbs, and he's earned that insulin sensitivity. Well, we've covered some of the basis for, for today, and um, I know you have to run here soon, so yeah. we're going we're gonna to quickly wrap this up. Um, we're going to do a part two probably. Probably, so we, so. We, so we can um, really dive into the nuts and bolts of more right. like the advanced, hey, here, here's how to become you know, a, super, a super dad with mm -hmm. protocols that still fit into your timeline yeah. with training, recovery, nutrition. Yeah. Um, but real quick, I just want to see your thoughts. It's, it's kind of a fireball question. Okay, I was waiting for it. So if you could put one thing on a billboard, and the biggest highway could be health related, it could be anything motivational. One or two sentences for everyone to read when they pass by. What would you put there and why? It's a good question. I'd probably say the thing that hit me first was don't believe the lie. Right? I think that you know our world and our country is constantly trying to bring people down from the negativity and they're not giving you the right information. As you know, in blood, you know, your normal is not optimal, right? Normal is Homer Simpson. So I think that you know, there's a lie out there that people can't be what they want to be and they can't achieve things that they should be able to achieve. And they believe that lie and then they attach their identity on that. And then soon enough, they're you know controllable and they're locked into the system. And, and so, yeah, I would, I'd probably say don't believe the lie. I love it. Jared, where can people find you if they don't live around this area? Do you offer any training programs online or maybe something in the future where people can kind of learn more about you? Where can they follow you on yeah. social media as well? So Great. Cool. Yeah. You can just find us at BYB Fitness TX on Instagram. That's also our Facebook handle. Um, you can email the office info at BYB Fitness TX. Um, yeah, we have, we offer training programs of all different sizes and shapes and our, you know, our personal training is fantastic. You know, it's results guaranteed. So if you, you know, we, we agree to train together, you will get the result that you want or else you get your money back. I've never written a check to this day. So it's been, the track record has been pretty good. Thank God. Awesome. And one last question for mm -hmm. you. If you could take one supplement with you on a desert island. No, it could be anything. It, it could be a supplement, but it could be something health related. Um, what would you take with you and why? Testosterone. Testosterone, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, truthfully, I think magnesium is right up there. I know you're kind of leading into that, but between magnesium and vitamin D, it would probably be a, a toss-up. Um, if I'm on a, a deserted island, I'm assuming it's not like up in the Aleutians in, yeah. uh, in Alaska. I'm putting, put, putting myself in a tropical space. So I, I'll probably take magnesium with me for a lot of different reasons. It's changed my life and also my business. So yeah, shout out to you for that. Yeah, that, that's always my supplement, but it doesn't have to be that one for everyone. But um, yeah, I mean, you're going to get vitamin D from the sun. Mm -hmm. Magnesium is going to help activate it. You're probably not going to, you know, maybe find a coconut or some electrolytes or something like that. So yeah, I'm going to find a tree to chop down and lift and carry and flip. So I'm going to need that magnesium for my recovery and for my performance output. Well, Jared, I, I appreciate today. It's been a, uh, it's been an honor speaking with you. Th these are conversations every day, guys. We, we, we do this at the gym at BYB. So if anyone's looking for a great gym, a great trainer to partner with, you know, Dar Jared is definitely someone to, uh, to contact. So thanks again, guys. We'll do a part two. Let us know your questions in the comments. Appreciate you. God bless. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. It was fun. Thanks for listening to the Fredrickson Health Show. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss a single episode. While you're at it, leave us a rating and review. Follow us on social media and subscribe to our email newsletter for more information.